Hi, I'm Roger Mader from Ampersand. I'm here to talk to you today about 10 types of innovation. When we talk about innovation, we typically talk about innovating by creating new products. Here's the Oxo Peeler, designed by an engineer specifically for his wife who had arthritis and couldn't use the traditional 79 cent peeler, so he made one that would cost $7.90, 10 times the price level. It became an amazing platform for an entire array of kitchen offerings from Oxo, uh, produced by Smart Design. However, that product functional innovation is really only just one type. Consider, for example, what IKEA does by putting together a product system, bringing together a whole suite of products that together create a broader experience. This is not unlike Microsoft creating the Microsoft Office platform and bundling together numerous products to create a full system. Together, product function and system refer to the underlying offering. This could be as true for a service as it is for a product. On the far extreme, we have the customer end of this value chain, and Apple embodies innovations around end user or customer experience. Everything that you experience with Apple, from the packaging to the product, from the hardware to the software, is integrated into a seamless whole to give you a delightful experience. Virgin is famous for Richard Branson's desire to constantly create an unconventional experience for you that makes you feel like a maverick. Virgin is always connoting this singular brand experience. Amazon is, of course, transformational by virtue of creating a new channel, a new way for consumers to connect with the products that they love and for Amazon to constantly know you better based on your underlying behaviors. Zappos, now part of Amazon, started as a shoe service, a purchasing retail experience that didn't even own shoes. They first wanted to get to know customers and would go buy the shoes retail and sell them often at a loss. Originally, while they were building up the foundation of their business, based purely on exceptional service. Together, this right side of the spectrum represents the way that you engage with your customer. There are also innovations that take place on the back end of the business, less visible to the end user. Zara, for example, has innovated consistently on its underlying processes to bring high-end fashion to the store within three weeks. Typically, planning takes place seasons in advance, quarters, certainly months, before inventory arrives in the store. Zara does it in three weeks and takes it out in three weeks. This encourages shoppers to come in on a repeat basis, which drives profit, and it's done seamlessly behind the scenes. Whole Foods has a different structure than you might be aware of. All they're doing simply here is measuring the business differently. Most retailers, most stores, are constantly measuring one store against another. Whole Foods is taking each of the departments, like produce, for example, in comparable markets, so in a major urban center like New York or Los Angeles, it's comparing the produce departments. And what they learn from that, they spread throughout the community of produce managers. Think about that as the unit of action that people can really work from. Target had to compete against Walmart. Walmart had the unbeatable business model of always offering the cheapest price. Target couldn't afford to do that at the same scale, so what they did was try and give you a better experience. And they did it in a very clever way. They co-opted their suppliers, their partners, the people who are bringing the product into their stores to work with them to create coherent experiences around the things that shoppers enjoy. I don't go shopping for just an element in my home. I might go shopping for bathroom fixtures and fittings, or kitchen, or some other part of my home. And so Target bundled together all kinds of different products and, and suppliers in order to create unique experiences. Gillette is, of course, the breakthrough model of razors and blades. We all know that selling the handle once and the blades many times creates almost a subscription model of repeat business for them and locks you in for a lifetime brand experience. Together, this back end of the business model refers to your business configuration. These are incredible domains of innovation that are obvious to the business themselves, but non-obvious to the marketplace. When you think about where the money's going, most companies spend their time investing around launching new products and services in the center of this value chain. However, in interviews performed by Doblin Group, the innovation team at Deloitte who invented this model, CFOs would tell them that the return on investment is much higher at the ends of the spectrum, where they've either got a totally different kind of financial model or network partnerships, or where they're creating a transformational customer experience, a, a breakthrough in brand or in the channel that they're using. When you think about it, everyone investing in the middle means you're all competing on the same form function factors. That means that 
you're eventually going to be competing on price. When you compete on the outer edges, you've got differentiation that's much harder for your competitors to replicate. So Swiffer, for example, co-opted the razors and blades model in order to be able to sell mops. Mops that don't clean as well as a bucket of water and a, and a raggedy Andy mop, but they clean more easily, more efficiently, less mess, less fuss. Consumers love it. The Apple iPod and the whole iTunes music platform transformed an industry, and it did so by bringing together eight types of innovation, mostly about breaking down the cartel of music companies that wouldn't sell a single song for 99 cents until Apple made it happen. Uber transforms the whole livery industry, a group that doesn't own cars, a group that doesn't employ drivers, yet creates a much better experience for most people in most locations because they're disintermediating the market between the consumer and the driver through logistics and technology. That's seven types of innovation. Zara, as we mentioned, primarily is focusing on the underlying process, but they're bringing together five types of innovation to give you a different kind of consumer experience through this network model of different partners in order to, through underlying processes, turn over their inventory at a much more rapid clip. And Google is one of the rare exceptions that represents 10 types of innovation through its underlying search model, creating a better, faster, cheaper way for you to access the myriad sources of data on the World Wide Web. Like all businesses, everything, every offering represents 10 types of functional business. It's the way that you choose to innovate in combinations of these areas that makes the difference in separating the experience for your customers and the competitive advantage you have against your competitors. For more on this, I'd refer you to Larry Keeley's book, The 10 Types of Innovation, with fantastic case studies. I owe a great debt of gratitude to Larry, as he's been important in my thinking and my career. And the folks at Doblin, again, you can reach at Deloitte. Thank you very much. I'm Roger Mader.